from Barangaroo Studios, the AusBiz COB is the key stuff you need to know about the day in business and finance. I almost don't feel like I should say welcome today. What a day. Well, thank you anyway for joining us on the COB. I'm Juliette Sali on a shocker of a day for investors. We are seeing the ASX 200 have its biggest one day fall since March 2023. Um, a lot of selling happening in Japan. That's of note too. The Tokyo Nikko index has been down by as much as 5%. Scotty just pointed out to me that the Topics Banking Index, so all the big banks in Japan, they're having their worst sell-off since the height of the global financial crisis. So a lot of unwinding being done. Perhaps not a surprise. Remember we hit a record on the ASX 200 earlier this week. In fact, just yesterday, above 8,100 points. I remember speaking to Tim Rocks from Evans & Partners on Wednesday Day saying, look, at that stage, at that level, they would be trimming out of the Australian market. It seems like a lot of people got that memo and they have started to sell down. I'm going to be talking to Shane Oliver in a moment too from AMP. And I just read his weekly report. He gave me a sneak peek at what he sends out to the media. And of course, remember that they had their year end forecast around 8,100, which we already hit this week. He says there are risks to that being seen Again, basically, we might see some selling and then a little bit of a wobble, and then we might reach that again by the end of the year. He'll put it into better words than I have when I speak to him in a couple of minutes, but it certainly seems for now that those levels have been tested. And remember, of course, that we're into the reporting season as well. So a lot of nervousness out there, a lot of concern as well about what we're going to see in terms of the global economy. So our three themes of the day, of course, certainly this risk off momentum that's flown through into currencies as well. The yen, no surprise, of course, moving high, which is weighing on Japanese stocks, but it is that classic safe haven move as well, particularly now you've got uh, the Bank of Japan lifting rates to those levels that we haven't seen since 2008. And it's all about non-farm payrolls looming tonight. The US jobs report, is that going to be weak? Is that going to then signal that the, perhaps the uh, Fed has to cut rates by 50 basis points in September rather than 25 basis points? And a lot of this unwinding as well amid these expectations that potentially the Fed has moved too slowly in delivering these cuts that we've been talking about and have been flagged for about a year now. All right, let's have a look at our market again as we see these losses of more than 2%, and particularly as we see a lot of weakness coming through in these uranium players. Deep Yellow down by as much as 19% today. Boss, Paladin Energy, Bannerman Energy also under significant pressure. The big miners as well weighing. Fortescue's had a shocker of a week. I mean, a lot of people had been saying that it was too expensive, but it had that big block trade earlier in the week. It sort of recovered somewhat, and now it's down 1.5%. BHP also down one5 half percent and Rio off seven tenths of one percent even though you have seen a bit of a lift in iron ore futures because we had that um, positive note from Rio Tinto that they're seeing strong demand from China for iron ore. A quick look on energy players as well following very closely what's happening in the crude oil space amid the escalation of tension in the Middle East. Woodside and Santos both off by more than two percent today. But of course where do you go when you don't know what to buy? You flock to those safe havens and gold stocks are moving Moving higher, Newmont up 1.4%, Evolution, Regis and Northern Star slightly higher again today. All right, well, another stock which was an outperformer today was Block. It was um, up by as much as 5%. Now it upgraded its full year guidance, but it also flagged this 3 billion US dollar share buyback, which sent shares tracking higher. We also heard that the Afterpay co-founder Nick Molnar has been elevated to Block's head of sales. Andrew spoke to ResMed CEO Mick Farrell today, of course, always concerns about whether or not those weight loss drugs are weighing on their business. He says, no, that is not the case. ResMed shares, though, did sell off in the latter part of trade. Macquarie also dropped as it flagged a potential hybrid issue raising and John's Ling Group eased on plans to acquire a company for $57.6 million, while the financial software provider Iris came under pressure. It completed the expected sale of its UK mortgage sales business to Bain for $167 million. Let's get more on the market sell-off, what it means for these levels that we had been seeing on the market. Shane Oliver from AMP. I sort of tried to um, summarize your report before and I think I did a really bad job of it. Can you explain to us what we're seeing in terms of the fact that the market hit your forecast already, but you know that might be it for a while? Uh, look, I, I fear that it could be. Uh, look, there's several things going on here. One is 
this time of year is traditionally seasonally weak for share markets, August, September. Uh, secondly, I think markets are starting to get worried about a potential recession. Uh, we have seen a lot of softer economic data recently out of the US and including this week uh, for job openings, quits, number of people quitting for new jobs, uh, rise in jobless claims, uh, the ISM index, the manufacturing index falling, and the employment component looking very weak. Uh, and so the, the focus of investors have gone from, if you want to look about it this way, a couple of years ago, everyone worried about inflation. Uh, at the time, concerns about recession were premature. Then we went through a Goldilocks phase where inflation was falling. Investors were focusing on prospects for rate cuts, and but growth was still good. And then now perhaps investors are starting to think, well, maybe the central banks have overdone it. Uh, you know, the Fed itself says we now have to focus not just on getting inflation down, but we've also got to focus on making sure we don't stuff up employment. Uh, yeah. So focusing on the both sides of the dual mandate. So the focus has shifted, if you like, and that's why we're getting all this twitchiness. You have these days where the market's up one and a half percent. Uh, celebrating imminent rate cuts like we saw on Wednesday in Australia. Not imminent rate cuts, but the absence of rate hikes here at least, but imminent rate cuts in the US. Uh, and then you go through other days where suddenly it's all flipped around again and, and the market's focusing somewhere else. Uh, at the same time, you've got these concerns that the tech profits haven't been quite as good as hoped for. I don't think they're too bad, but market was priced for perfection in regards to tech and AI. And therefore, when you don't get perfection and the results are a bit mixed or there's some talk of slower growth ahead or whatever it is, uh, it's not so good. So we put those two things together. Uh, tech stocks were hit, but so too was the so-called uh, rotation trade mm. with Russell 2000 down overnight, down Dow down as well, and our market as well. And then you throw into the mix China where the data remains soft and the uh, government there still doesn't want to provide any stimulus. So, so I think it really is a bit of a growth scare we're seeing here. Yeah, absolutely. What a week when you think about the BOE, the BOJ, the Fed. But <laughs> we've got the RBA next week completing the Central Bank Olympics. Um, of course, no change really expected. But I guess talk us through why there might be more chatter now going to that thematic of rate cuts rather than that thought of rate hikes that was about a month ago. Well, partly it's because... The market has to talk about something. You know, we mm -hmm. have to talk about something. So <laughs> we were talking about the risk of rate hikes. So now attention just turns to, well, when rates might start coming down. That, that chart there just shows how much expectations have changed this year. We started the year off really optimistic, uh, partly fueled by what was going on in the US. There was talk of seven cuts in the US. Uh, and then, of course, we got those fantastically low uh, monthly inflation indicators in Australia through December, January and February. And then, of course, it started to get it wane a little bit. You know, the, we got some higher than expected inflation in the March quarter. It didn't come down as much. And then we got numbers for March, April, May. And, uh, of course, at the end of the May numbers, when the, the April numbers were coming out, then the May numbers, the market suddenly thinking, well, rates will have to go up, not down. Uh, now we're swinging back the other way. I think that tells us a bunch of things, just how twitchy things are in markets at the moment. Secondly, uh, the uselessness of that silly CPI indicator, uh, which the ABS produces. <laughs> I, I was somewhat perplexed as to why they were introducing it in the first place. I, I think it's just uh, a bunch of economists who think more is better than less, but in this case, it's not. Um, it, it just creates a lot of noise. You don't really know the truth until you get the final monthly number and that comes out on the same day as the quarterly number. So you might as well ditch the first two and just get the quarterly number. Mm. Uh, so I, I think the ABS should ditch the uh, monthly CPI and just focus on the quarterly one. But anyway, anyway, that's a, a by the by bug on my part. But uh, so we have seen these big swings around. The question is whether the uh, the RBA will be confident enough at the uh, at the end of October, going into November, to start cutting in November. So yeah. the reason why people focus on November is that by then we get the September quarter inflation numbers at the end of October. They're going to show a big improvement. I think the RBA should be cutting then, but I think it's unlikely they'll have enough confidence to do so, and they'll probably wait for another quarter of inflation, which takes us to the 
uh, to the end of January, the February meeting, when I think they probably will cut. Now, something could change that, and that is if share markets keep falling, uh, or you get some sort of you know, major concerns about the global economy, and we get a run of weak economic data. You know, this, this soft data in the US turns into a major uh, collapse in economic data, and you get something similar in Australia. Then the RBA could go a little bit earlier, but in the absence of that, I think they probably wait uh, till February. I'm a bit concerned that is now consensus, yeah. uh, according to yeah. the surveys I've seen this week. Well, you said it and, first, Shane. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's consensus. And the money market, which was saying, well, no rate cut until sometime late next year, is now saying it could come as early as December. So the money market's flipped from one extreme, which you can see in that chart we just put up. Yeah. What do you think is the most pertinent thing for Michelle Bullock to focus on now? Is it is it what's happening overseas, particularly when you've got the Fed signalling cuts and the BOJ hiking? Uh, look, I think the BOJ is a bit of a sideshow, but it does affect the so-called carry trade. I, I think the BSJ was BOJ was just lagging. They've had decades of subpar inflation, so it was understandable they were going to take longer. Um, they're not indicative of the global trend. The global trend is now towards lower rates. We are seeing a consistent easing cycle getting underway. The the, the blue bar down there at the bottom is Japan starting to hike, um, but you're now seeing increasing number of central banks globally starting to cut. That's the red bars, the red lines at the top there. Uh, so that's the direction we're going to go in, and we will do the same thing. Um, I, I know we wring our hands about how bad inflation is in Australia compared to other countries. Well, you know, it's it's just the flip side of what happened in 2022. You know, we took longer to pick up than those countries did. We, we were congratulating ourselves at the time, saying, or 2021 rather, and into 2022, you know, we don't have to be as aggressive. Then suddenly we found we do have a problem, but it's the same on the way down. Uh, we lagged on the way up, we're lagging on the way down, we will come down. But I, I think ideally, uh, yeah, Michelle needs to say, yes, inflation is still too high. Uh, that uh, we still want to see more confidence that it's coming down, but I think they also need to indicate that they are that they are focused on preserving the, those gains on employment as far as possible. And they don't want to see unemployment go to go up too much. So, in other words, start to edge, edge towards a bit more of balance yeah. in the statement. Yeah. But I have a feeling they'll they'll probably focus a bit more on the hawkish stuff. That chart just there just shows how we lagged on the way up. Where the uh, the blue line, the blue dashes of the monthly one, a bit hard to see precisely, but uh, yeah, we lagged on the way up. We picked at a lower level and we're just lagging on the way down. It's not uh, particularly exciting. I, I think we're now going to see inflation coming in a lot lower in the months ahead. Obviously, the cost of living measures, uh, but we will, we will start to see what the US is now seeing. That's a beautiful chart, and it reminds me of all the colours of the Olympics, Shane. Now, how much are you watching? I said to a friend that I was exhausted, more exhausted than the athletes, I'm sure, because they don't have to get up at 2 a.m. to watch the gymnastics, um, obviously tongue-in-cheek. But what are you watching, and, and what do you think, or how do you think Australia is doing? Well, swimming is usually my favourite at the Olympics. So, I, mean, I, I, I mean, it's probably one of those sports where I could have been good at, but uh, didn't really. <laughs> I was never that interested in trying to beat people in a swimming pool. But, um, uh, yeah, so I always find swimming the most fascinating. And obviously that gives us a leg up. I think in the first week the swimming comes early and then it, we tail off a little bit. But so far we're actually doing pretty well. If you look at uh, medals per person, uh, then we are actually up there with the best. You know, we're, we're in the top, uh, I think we're ranked uh, in terms of gold medals. We're in the top uh, or equal fourth or something. Uh, in, in rank. Uh, we've got about eight gold medals so far. Um, but if you adjust for population size, then we're, we're shooting the lights out relative to the US, relative to France, relative to China. We're actually doing pretty well. Now, of course, you could then say, well, if you adjust for GDP size, we're not doing as well, but we still look pretty good in the great scheme of things. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, yet again, I think Australian athletes are doing fantastically well in uh, in France, I mean, it has been a very distracting week, I must find. There's all sorts of funny things going on. There's the US election. There's what's going on in France. There's what's going on in the Middle East, you know, potential for an escalation there. And obviously, there's all those central banks. So it has been a very messy week for markets and for economists. And it, it's not that surprising that it's been so volatile, even though the Olympics is probably the most benign, effect, benign event. 
and not really having an impact on markets, apart from keeping uh, people up late at night. I love that. Shane Oliver could have been an Olympian if he could be bothered um, really trying to beat people in the pool rather than being friends with everyone. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. And you've got to get up really early. Yeah, Yeah, nobody wants to do that. These these people have real dedication here. I really admire that, but I could never get up that early day after day after day to swim up and down a swimming pool. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure that's the only reason between you and Olympic glory, but you are winning the Economics (laughs) Olympics. Shane, always a pleasure. Thanks so much. Have a good weekend. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having me from AMP there. All right, well, we talked about um, ResMed and that was our stock of the day. Luke Winchester from Meriwether Capital and June Bay Lu from Tribeca Investment join the Dean. I've actually been quite critical of ResMed in the past. I think the effects of Ozempic might have overshadowed some of the, the, the operational issues they were having, particularly around that gross margin, which, you know, fell from the sort of 59, 60% down to 54, 55 about a year ago when the, the share price really bottomed out. Uh, but this was a good result, you know, that gross margin back up towards that 59%. Um, you know, no, no big restructuring charges or anything below the line either. It was a very clean result, very good cash. Uh, leading up into this result, people were actually a bit worried about or whether they can hold the margin because the freight cost has gone up a lot. Um, but they said, look, you know, we'll give some guidance that the margin is above a consensus of the gu- uh, range, uh, close to 59%. Um, and um, and then the freight, they said we can manage um, within expectations. So, you know, so I think there's a good result. You should see a consensus upgrade between 4 and 5%. Um, today's share price is sort of moving between up one to down one. Um, I do think that when the US market does uh, open up, it will be um, up more significantly. Okay, so there you go. It's, it's a buy. buy. Mm-hmm. It's a buy. Just wondering if the guys out there have had a chance to even find five leaders today. It was a very bad day, but let's have a look. We know Block should be up there. It was a standout. Uh, it is the front runner, in fact, up 5%. Pinnacle Investment as well. And then, of course, a couple of the gold stocks really just on that safe haven buying. But if you look at the fact that um, the third best stock today only had a gain of 1.8%, that tells you all you need to know. Let's have a look at the laggards today. There were plenty of those really led by these losses in uranium players and also dominoes pizza coming under pressure down about 10 percent perhaps telling us something about the consumer as well let's have a look at the small cap leaders and laggards aspire mining had a good day up 10 percent and to the downside today in the small end of town we saw aura energy elevate uranium alligator energy zero resources and 29 metals limited so all in the materials and energy space lower big night tonight we've got u.s non-farm payrolls um, really in terms of how that's going to affect the currency market the bond market as well and of course the Fed. So that will give us the US unemployment rate. We've also got factory orders and then some big names as well with the likes of Chevron and ExxonMobil issuing earnings. Looking ahead to next week, it's all going to be about the RBA. And look, if you have any interesting um, thoughts or comments that you'd like us to ask, Michelle Bullock, we will be at the press conference. So please send them in, news at ausbiz.com.au. We've also got ANZ Indeed job advertisements for July, the Judo Bank PMI, uh, monthly business turnover indicator and the Melbourne Institute inflation gauge happening locally. Um, So, of course, another very big week. It will be Central Bank Olympics continuing on a day when it has been a terrible session for markets. 2.5% drop on the SIBO 200, a similar fall on the ASX 200. So we hit that record of 8,100 and we swiftly came off it. Uh, the ASX 200 now at 7,937 points. Pretty much, well, every sector, I should say, is very firmly in the red today. It's not really a positive note to leave you on, but um, you know, maybe you'll just continue to watch the Olympics over the weekend and we'll be back with all the market Olympics from 9.45 Eastern on Monday. Have a good weekend.